Welcome everyone. We are here today because we have a very special speaker. So Andre is uh, an integrative medicine physician, energy healer, acupuncturist, meditation teacher and best-selling author who's been on opera and teaches all over the world at the moment. And if you Google Dr. Andre Pennington, you'll find so much information. So Andre, you must have been busy your whole life. <laughs> And it was interesting to watch how you were navigating from different areas related to health and well-being and how you finally uh, found Awakened Mind Institute and uh, the Mind Mirror, searching for neurofeedback uh, that could be integrated into what you're already doing. So today's program is called Reconnect to the Essential Self for Healing Chronic Illness, Depression and Trauma. Well, I would just like to second those emotions and say uh, welcome, Andrea, that we are indeed delighted to have you uh, joining us uh, with your interest and, in fact, your fascination with this mind mirror work and your, we hope you'll talk a little bit about the research that you're planning with it. Um, and I would just invite you to take right off. You know exactly what you're going to do. You're a master uh, presenter and thank you for being here and please feel free to Take the reins whenever you wish. Thank you. Well, Oksana and Judith, I just, I honor you and thank you for creating this space for us to connect. And for everyone that I've not yet connected with or met, hello. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be part of this community. I grew up with a love and a fascination for all things mystical, for all things dealing with the mind-body connection, magic, ESP, even as a child, I felt more connected to a spirit realm, whatever you want to call that, more than I felt connected to the earth. I kind of had this sort of low level melancholy as if I just, it wasn't so much like I totally didn't belong, but it, it's just that I knew that my home was really elsewhere. And even as a kid, I would have like precognitive dreams um, I knew things before other people knew things. I could read energies. But when I started to talk to my friends about it, I found out that not everybody had those abilities and people thought I was weird. And I think when I hit my teenage years, I would have so many visions of things, but it would be like right as they were about to happen or just at the same time. So I remember someone um, who was unfortunately killed. And I remember just asking God, like, why give me this gift if I can't intervene? If I'm not going to get it early enough to like do something, then this is kind of useless. And I remember just sort of like deciding to turn it off. I just didn't want to be the weirdo. And I never knew that there were like millions of other people who had these same abilities until I got into my 20s and 30s and I, I started to hear about other people. Um, by that time, I discovered um, Carl Jung. I read books on dream interpretation and understanding all these different levels of consciousness and the self. And I just became fascinated um, at university because I was introduced to meditation. And I'd pretty much been meditating kind of all my life in different ways. But I discovered when I got to university, I was pre-med. So I was a bio major and a chemistry minor um, at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And I was also doing a lot of performing arts. So I was performing in professional theater. I was the manager of our TV station at the campus and doing really heavy stuff. So I was kind of on a parallel track. And there were moments when I just felt overwhelmed by the volume of information, data, and ideas. And that's when I heard that through meditation, you could like quiet the mind, gain clarity, gain access even to creativity. And so for me, I was like, okay, so I'm used to sitting and pondering or just, you know, gazing out the window. And that's when I started to read more about these mystics and yogis who had uh, magical superpowers, <laughs> which, you know, I kind of believed in. I knew that I had something like that, you know, from my childhood. And so the idea that meditation could give us access to even more of these superpowers, it just seemed like so logical. Like, I know we have the, the ability, if I could only train in it, that would be awesome. 
And uh, so eventually I, I met Deepak Chopra, who told me lots of wonderful stories uh, about his time in India and people who really could like levitate and walk through walls and all these kinds of things. So it's been um, a love and a passion of mine, um, you know, again, since my childhood. But when I finished my medical training, I, um, I got hired by the Discovery Channel. And I started to work as their medical director and spokesperson and was hosting documentaries and anchoring the health news. And at the same time, I opened up a wellness center. So I was doing TV by day and in the afternoons and evenings and weekends. I was seeing patients in a holistic spa and wellness center. And I had also been trained in acupuncture um, starting in my fourth year of med school. And so I was kind of doing these, again, this sort of dual track between the creative, you know, right brain stuff and this left brain analytical stuff. And it, this kind of gave me that sense of, okay, this, this works or it, it worked for me for a while. <laughs> but um, after a while, uh, what I started to notice with my patients is I started um, attracting a certain kind of client. Um, my mother, who's also a physician and also performed acupuncture, she came to the Washington DC area. I kind of skipped a little bit, but I, I ended up in DC where, um, in Maryland, where the Discovery Channel headquarters were. And my mother and I were working together and she had been helping women who were addicted to crack cocaine back in the nineties when the crack epidemic was just crazy. And she had learned this needle, this acupuncture needle technique on the ears, um, the NADA protocol, to help people detox. And they could detox as outpatients, which to me at the time, um, you know, when I had learned about it in med school, I had just finished a psych rotation where we looked at people who were detoxing and withdrawing from serious substances. And it was not a pretty sight. So when my mother told me about it, I thought, okay, you're nuts. You can't, that's not even humane to not have them, you know, in the hospital hooked up to IVs and getting all this supportive therapy. But she was telling me that these women who were addicted to cocaine or crack, they were in the postpartum period, um, or that some of them were still pregnant, and they were able to detox, and they were able to like gain control of their mind and their drug cravings and drug dreams. And that within a matter of not even a whole week, some of them started to petition to the court to get their children back, like they were being transformed. And so when I finished med school and she and I went into business together, we were already integrating this Eastern and Western approach, treating um, eating, uh, eating disorders and addiction. And so obviously you realize that you start to attract a certain client who is traumatized. Because as we were you know, helping them with all the supportive care, my mom and we had a psychologist there doing all of the therapy and I was doing like behavior mod and acupuncture and sort of empowerment coaching. But I noticed that there were patients that wouldn't get better or they would switch addictions. They would like start getting their lives in order, get, getting their symptoms in check. Or if they were in our binge eating disorder program, they'd lose weight and then they'd get to a point where they would just sabotage. And not everyone, it wasn't everyone. We had a huge um, success rate, but there was this like subset of the population that was really struggling. And so being the little nerdy <laughs> scientist, I started to dig in and in our interdisciplinary meetings, like I try to figure out like what was that common thread? What were the triggers? What was making them, you know, um, go off the rails? And as, um, as things would work out, it, it sounded like these people didn't believe that they were worthy of love, of happiness, of success, or of health. Like there was this fundamental belief that they were not good enough, that they were just fundamentally flawed, wrong, bad. And when the, the psychiatrists and psychologists were talking about some of their cases, Yes, some of them had major traumas, like they had experienced serious abuse or neglect um, or assault in their lives. And some of them were just milder 
I say mild, for them it wasn't mild, but not the big T trauma as, as people say, but things that just didn't go well at home, um, maybe a, a parent who was ill, but you know, it wasn't dead or anything, but there were just, you could see that there were all of these, now what we call them, these adverse childhood experiences. These things that had happened in their past that for whatever reason, they either didn't get them processed through a compassionate adult or caregiver, or they didn't go to therapy. For whatever reason, those traumas were left unhealed. And the kind of psychic wounds that were left were these beliefs that they were flawed or that they were unworthy of love or that things that happened in their life were actually their fault. Were they, was this mostly uh, among, uh, uh, was this mostly childhood adverse effects, things that happened when people were very young? A good deal of them were, yes. And for some of them, they saw that they had repeated, repeated, repeated patterns. Um, but yes, for many of them, they were young people when their original traumas took place in this lifetime. We'll put a pin in that for later. <laughs> um, so it was interesting to me because as I started to work with them and kind of hear their thought processes and what was going on, I could actually relate to some of it. Now, I didn't have any major trauma in my past. My parents were divorced, which is on that ACE list. Um, and I grew up with an influence from my father that was very strict. It was very much about, uh, for me and my siblings, you know, you go to school, you go to college, you focus on your grades. That's the most important thing. So <laughs> I gave my dad fits being so involved in the arts and theater and band and cheerleading and all these other extracurricular things. So I kind of had this driving force that started in childhood and I noticed it in my early 30s that despite all the things I achieved, there was this low level feeling of not good enough. I didn't feel like I was smart enough. And I later found out there was this thing called imposter syndrome. And I was like, that's me. I feel like a fraud. I feel like this, this fear, this pervasive fear that someone's going to find out I haven't done enough research or I'm not smart enough or all of that. And so I recognized that there was this you know, hidden subconscious belief that I wasn't good enough. And that's what kind of led me into getting more training in trauma and recovery, uh, positive psychology, and just trying to understand how I could best help my patients. Like, how could I help them know that, of course, you're fundamentally worthy of all good things in life. But it wasn't until um, my, my mid-30s when I was starting to experience um, depression. I had always had a little bit of that throughout my life, but I got to a point where it was really dark. And again, at the time I was doing television, um, I was doing all of the kind of things that from the outside world would have looked incredibly successful. And you know, you guys know the story, you've heard it, like. We've all heard this story a bazillion times. And I got to a point where I realized that all of the work I was doing on TV, like we had built this image, this Dr. Andrea brand, and it was only just a fraction of me. So while I had this wellness center on the side and I was learning all these things about the mind-body connection and, and studies, it wasn't just that I was out in woo-woo land, I was like reading studies about how meditation works and breath work and nutrition could literally change the health process. But when I wanted to bring it over and report that on the news or through the documentaries, at that time, they weren't having it. And so I was starting to feel this tension inside of me, this kind of warring that I wanted to really express all of the amazingness that I was uh, learning about. And I felt like that TV image was just two dimensional. It was not fulfilling. And I happened to have um, the opportunity to visit uh, the Mediterranean on vacation. And at this point, I decided that I was just going to go on this vacation, you know, anonymously. At that, at that time in America, um, Discovery Health Channel was in like 90 million homes. So I was being recognized on the streets and at cafes and things. But we didn't have 
Discovery Health Channel, you know, broadcast all over Europe. So I knew that I could come and just be anonymous. So I, I was going to be this, you know, artistic version of me. <laughs> and as the law of attraction would have it, I started getting recognized. Well, not recognized for anything that people saw on television, but people were responding to me as if I really was this famous artist. And I met someone in Saint-Tropez in the south of France and mentioned that I was a jazz singer. And he said, oh, I'm going to get you in. You're going to come and you're going to sing in the hottest spot in Saint-Tropez. And I wasn't going to back down because I was like, oh, it's so glamorous. You know, yeah, I'm going to do this. So I'm up there, you know, in this DJ booth and there's hundreds of people. And it's just, I mean, everything just seems so chic and so beautiful. And I'm singing my heart out. And it was the first time in years that I felt this like love, a sense of flow and bliss between me and the audience. And it was like, they didn't know who I was. They hadn't read my bio, but I felt like they were seeing me and, and responding to the real me. And so I left in this sort of ecstatic haze. I got back to my hotel room and the, the morning when I woke up, I, I literally was like, what just happened? Did that just happen? How did that happen? And it was like, I got this sense of just wonder. And then it hit me that in two days, I'd have to go back, back to America, back to all that responsibility with the TV station, with my patients, with all of these doctors who were then at this, time, at this point working for me. And that's when I felt this like, strangling feeling, this darkness of depression that got so intense that I, I called out to God to take my life because I just, I couldn't imagine going back and living that life anymore, especially after I'd had that taste of whatever that was. And I was crying. Um, I flung myself onto the bed shaking and I called out to God and said, take it take my life, take my business, my body. I don't know what I'm doing with it. And as I flung myself onto the bed, just sobbing and shaking, my body seemed to melt into the bed. And I felt like I was one with the bed. And then I had this, this bright, blinding light. And I remember kind of thinking, okay, how can the sun get any brighter in Khan? I mean, come on. And I'm like looking for the source of this light, but it wasn't out there, it was in here. And that's when I felt myself being drawn into the light and transported to the other side. And that's when I thought God was like answering my prayer. When I said, take my life, I, that's what it felt like. And as I got over to the other side, I was in once again, this feeling of intense bliss, just pure joy and love and, calm and bliss. And I could sense that there was this presence with me. I never saw it. I don't know if it was an angel or what, but I saw my entire life flash in front of me. Like, like people talk about, like in an instant, every scene played out and I could understand in one instant why I was depressed. It was as if I could see how every one of the decisions I'd made had led me very logically to being totally depressed and unhappy with my life. And it was as if this being was communicating to me. And I, I kind of remember asking like, so you mean I could have made different choices? Like I can choose, <laughs> which seems so silly now, of course, free will, right? Um, but I had this feeling like, oh, well, if I get to choose, then um, I'll go back. And that's when I had a new vision of me walking along the, the quasette, uh, the boardwalk, right on the Mediterranean. I was holding hands with a child, which to me seemed crazy because at that point I was just about 35 years old, single, didn't think I was going to have any children. I knew that I was living in France in this vision. I was singing professionally the last thing was a little weird because I saw that I was healing with my hands. And that's when I was like, really, God, you're going to make me a woo-woo doctor? 
but I was kind of like in this moment of surrender. So I was like, okay, well, everything else looks good. And that's when I came back into my body and all of the darkness, the depression, the anxiety was gone. And I remember calling my COO at the time, who was like the one person that I could tell all of my weirdness to. And I told him what happened and he didn't, he didn't even flinch. I was like, look, apparently I'm going to be singing. Apparently I'm going to be living in France. So we're going to have to change the way that you know, my institute works. And he was all on board with it. And within a couple of weeks, I had met Brian, the father of my child. Uh, a couple months later, I was pregnant. And then I started to dismantle um, basically everything in my life to line up with this vision that I had been given and this sense of freedom that I had. And that's when I started to do a ton of research on near-death experiences because I now understood that that's what that was. I had never heard of anyone having an NDE who wasn't like flatlining, you know, in surgery or an accident or in a coma. I never knew that people had had those experiences without some sort of catastrophe. But that's what led me into <clears throat> really studying consciousness and what happens um, in the brain. And uh, I discovered this guy's work. This guy, I don't know if you've, I didn't mention this to you, Judith, when I was there, Todd Murphy. Um, but he's done all this wonderful research with Michael Persinger and um, basically understanding which parts of our brain light up at, during mystical experiences whether they're self-induced from people who pray or whirling dervishes or what have you, but they can actually track. And what I discovered is that our brains are wired for mystical experiences. And then there was this Time Magazine cover story that said, wired for God, where all this data was now being presented to the whole world. Like we have circuits that when they're firing, you might hear voices, you might see you know, an angel, you might leave your body. So to me, it was like fascinating because for me, it cleared away all that depression, like being reconnected to source or whatever that is, I call it God, but one, for me, I call it oneness because that's what I felt. I felt like everything was one. I had seen this vision that we come down as these little droplets of light, of God consciousness, and that when we incarnate, it's up to us to, to figure out what we're going to do with our lives. And for me, it took everything away. It took all of the fear of being my authentic self. I mean, I didn't 100% start singing and going on TV and talking like I talk today. It took a little bit of, of time. But in terms of what I felt, like that stuff was gone. And knowing that I'm good enough all of that was instantaneous. Now, there were still years of perfectionism that I had to unlearn, but it gave me this new insight that I wanted to share with patients. And it's why I'm here with you all now. I knew that, okay, I had this weird mystical experience and I didn't induce it other than being in a complete surrender and hitting rock bottom. But as I started doing research in different um, spiritual cultures and all of the psychedelic research and um, shamanic journeying, I realized that there are many cultures and belief systems around the world that help people reconnect to this essential self with this sense of, of truth and, and worthiness. And I realized then that this is what my, my patients really needed because even though they were getting all of this supportive care and acupuncture and spa treatments and psychotherapy, and even hypnosis, you know, like some of them just weren't getting that connection that I feel like if we can help people reconnect to that essential part of themselves, then it will facilitate and or accelerate this healing process, healing of trauma and, and helping people to reprogram these long held beliefs. So that was sort of my journey into where I am today. I, I did eventually unplug from my media career in America. And nine years ago, I left the US and moved to the south of France with my daughter, who's now 13. Um, I did start practicing uh, a form of Qigong 
that I learned from um, learned about through Greg Braden. Uh, it's Jineng Qigong, and I am now healing with my hands, like the woo woo doctor vision I had. And <laughs> it all came right around, didn't it? <laughs> Mysteriously, majestically, and magically, yes. How did you know that France was the right place for you? I mean, I know that you saw it in the vision, but, but how did you end up in the particular place in France where you are now? The first time I heard somebody speaking French was I was like 12 years old. And it was as if it was like the Pied Piper kind of scenario. I was like drawn to it. And I started um, French class in seventh grade um, in public school and took it all the way through high school, visiting uh, France in my teens and 20s. I just always had this feeling like, oh, I could live here one day. Um, and when I got to my 30s, I thought, oh, maybe I'll retire there someday. But it, it's a place that um, I feel completely at home. It's almost like every time the plane lands, it's like every cell in my body and soul just says, ah, home. So I don't know if that's some past life stuff, you know, unfinished business, but this is the place that I feel happiest on the earth. So when I visited here in 2005, when I had that experience, um, it definitely felt right and felt good. That's fantastic. And Sienna, your daughter was born, born there in France? She was actually born in Maryland. She was almost born here. Um, but yeah, we, she was born in Maryland. So how did you get to the point of um, landing in France and knowing what you were going to do and then setting out to write a book? How did that come in? Well, self-love, we see it right behind you, right? The real yes. self-love handbook. Yes, yes. I knew it from the moment that I started doing research, you know, back in 2005 and 2006. Um, it was clear that I, I wanted to do a documentary and I wanted to do a book where I could share with people these other insights. Um, it, it didn't make sense for me to start writing it and, until I was here. Um, a few years into just being here and doing all this Qigong and meditation, I had so much more time because I wasn't doing TV. Um, I was just immersed in spiritual practice. And it started to emerge this, this five-step process that I could see that I went through and that I was being uh, sort of trained in through other modalities. And so that's what I've included in the book. Um, it's this five-step cornerstone process, um, which I have a few slides if you guys care to see it. But it happened while I was here. I was... Um, you know, just living my life on the Riviera and being a lot more chilled out and calm. And then it, it came to me, okay, now is the time. Now is the time to write this book and, and get it out. And voila. <laughs> How long did it take you to write the book? Was it like channeling, like it just poured itself out on the page or how, how what was the process like? The beginning was, the beginning flowed super easily. Um, this was back in... 2012, when I really sat down and said, okay, how will this be structured? I knew that there were kind of these three phases to learn who you really are, love who you really are, and then live who you really are. Mm -hmm. And looking back on how I was helping my patients, I kind of could see how it fit. But it was weird. I, I took time off. I was teaching at the University of Monaco and took time off from kind of all of my other duties to write, it came in a flood and then it stopped. <laughs> and then it was literally like two and a half years later that it came back in a mighty, mighty flood. And it was like, it's time. It's just, yeah, yeah. So it took a lot longer than some of my other books. You know, I'm just curious about, I mean, I have, I have, and I'm sure everyone else does have lots of questions for you, but I wonder, um, what relationship you think there might be between your, we we're going to call it a near-death experience, what it really was, was an incredible spiritual illumination, uh, an experience of cosmic consciousness. Uh, between that and between uh, the, the book, getting to the book, because the book wasn't part of the vision during the, yeah, so the book, the book was another thing. And then, so the book just is like a flash flood at two different points. 
Um, it's almost, it sounds like you were downloading the book based mm -hmm. of course on what you already knew and had studied, but still there was some uh, creative and possibly cosmic flow there. I mean, the, the book went on, went on to become a hit, a bestseller. It took you to Oprah twice, right? And it took you to really the TED Talks and a lot else. Actually, no, the Oprah thing was when I was still in America. Oh. That was with my first book. Um, my first book was The Pennington Plan, which was also a five-step plan, but was um, a little bit different. I wasn't quite as bold with all the spiritual stuff. Mm. Um, but what was interesting was when I came here and I was doing all of the, the meditation, it was just, just being a mom and meditating. It was like my life was so much simpler. And I remember distinctly kind of being in meditation and feeling this like urge, this rumbling, this thing telling me, it's time to get back on stage. It's time to get back on TV. And at first, like, I questioned myself, like, oh, is that your ego? You just miss being in, you know, the limelight? But as I sat with it, it was like, no, this is, you, you have a message and it's time. And I remember thinking, okay, if I'm going to come back out, then I have to rebrand myself. I have to let people know who I really am because I'm not going back as that same boring Discovery Channel doctor. <laughs> Some would argue that that's not boring, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it felt that way to me. And that was when I said, okay, well, if I'm going to brand myself, you know, what's the best way to do that? A TED Talk. And literally, this is crazy, Judith. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from one of our MBA grads at the University of Monaco saying, Dr. Pennington, would you be willing to give a TED Talk? We just get, got our first license. And I was like, wow, this stuff really works. And it was cool because I'd already started, you know, working on it. And so I did, um, I did do the TED Talk and it's now gotten 2 million views and it allowed me to like share my truth. It's not my, as a public speaker, it's not my best presentation ever, but it's one of the most honest. Um, I was really nervous because I had, I had my students in the audience. My daughter was there. There were my faculty from the university that were there. And, but it, I knew that I had to come clean and admit that I had been hiding this diagnosis of depression and that I'd had this mystical illumination and that I needed to just own the fact that this is who I, I really am. And I was nervous, but it actually had such a tremendous effect of people like coming to me and saying that they had similar experiences, not so much the mystical stuff, although a lot of um, NDE type stuff did come my way, but mostly people admitting that they too had been hiding parts of themselves or they'd gone into a career path because society or their parents or their school counselor pushed them into it, but they were denying this creative part of them. Um, so it was, it, it was, pretty phenomenal because right after that, that's when so many other things started opening up and I had much more confidence to just come out and be the real me. You know, this is quite a, uh, a shift for you, wasn't it? Because it sounds like uh, in the, at the time of the Pennington Plan book that you had were more of a holistic doctor, more of an expanded spiritual being than what should I say, 96% of all medical professionals throughout the entire world, or at least in the United States. Um, but that by the time you got to the Real Self Love Handbook, that there was tremendous expansion, both in depth and height, and uh, in your understanding. And yet, uh, in both instances, you really saw that it was a lack of self-love that was, was the issue. But the second book, there were uh, more spiritual uh, overtones, harmonics uh, in your message. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess you had to go all that distance yourself to get to that point um, of uh, breadth and scope. Because now anybody at any point along the path can just plug in <laughs> to your story. I mean, you've been down in the depths, you've been up in the heights. So, mm -hmm. so it's a book that would really appeal to an enormous number of people. So tell, tell us about what you're teaching and what those five steps are. I know that you may have a little process planned for us to experience as well. 
Yeah, if you'd like to, I, I'll share my screen and, and sh show you that. Um, but as a distinction, the, the, the Pennington plan came out before the mystical illumination. Right. And, and so even though I've, as I mentioned from childhood, had all that spiritual stuff I wanted to explore, I was too scared to do it. And I had published with a, one of the big publishers, Penguin, and they really just wanted to clamp down on anything that wasn't evidence-based. Just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> and since I was like a TV doctor, it was just like, no, they just pushed me more mainstream. So because I own my own publishing company now, and this is published by me, uh, I had far more liberty <laughs> to just share what is, you know, my truth. Yes. So I will share my screen and um, feel free to stop me at any time if you all have questions about the five steps. Um, I'll just give you that overview and then I'll take questions. So I've outlined all of this, the five-step process in um, the Real Self-Love Handbook. It's called the cornerstone process because I discovered that um, looking at master bricklayers and, and people, masons, when they laid the cornerstone of buildings, they would often bury underneath like information about who was going to live there or the, the founders or, and things. And I feel like that's what we all have. We, we have buried within us elements of our true self. And what's missing is just knowing it and loving it. And, but when we have that cornerstone in place, then we can construct a life that is full of vitality and joy and fulfillment. So this five-step process is um, also something that I've mirrored into a meditation that I will um, lead us through if we have time. These five steps um, are now what I've taught all over the world. I actually incorporated it into the, the Applied Positive Psychology course at the University of Monaco, which was kind of, kind of a rebel move for me, but um, something I'm happy about. So step one is awareness, or I should say, it, it happens in three phases, as I mentioned before. This awakening phase where you learn who you really are, a transformation phase where you love and accept who you are, and phase three is about thriving, where you actually live as your authentic self. And so in step one, it's awareness. Uh, step two is all about acceptance. And step three is about accountability four is inspired action, and five is appreciation. And so what I started to do within the wellness centers and in workshops is in step one, we look at kind of delineating for people what their programmed version of self is versus what we would consider the essential self, the authentic self, or the sovereign self. We are helping people figure out what is the programmed or the ego self, the personality, the faux self, whatever you want to call it, which um, through a series of different questionnaires, um, some of them have come from positive psychology and some of them just through the medical literature, helping people understand that who they've become or who they're acting as has been influenced by their upbringing, by the genetics, by their environment, and by their choices. But ultimately, we want to lead them back to uh, getting in touch with what I call the soul print or your spiritual DNA. One of the things that um, really impressed me very much was in Chinese medicine, there's these five elements. And in the five element theory, everything from wood, water, earth, metal, and fire, they, these energies are present in each of us and they influence each of us but we each have a different sort of signature pattern. And so we would literally have people take this vitality test. And if any of you are curious, it's totally free. The vitalitytest.com will tell you which of the five elements in Chinese medicine influence you and how these influences either make you incredibly brilliant, but also potentially uh, susceptible to stress and or burnout. Um, the VIA survey and some other things about just really helping people understand when you've had a peak experience or you've been in the flow state. Um, we have a, an entire life writing process where we allow a person to sort of write down all of the major turning points in their life, looking at what happened, where they were, and then identifying what beliefs and decisions they made 
at those various points and just kind of getting it all out onto paper. And then we invite them using the hero's journey as a structure to then write a story um, get into narrative therapy where not everybody has to publish them or share them with the world, but just going through this process and recognizing that they have been on their own heroic journey. And even if terrible things did happen to them, ultimately they can take this learning and reconnect with and resurrect what we would call the authentic self or the sovereign self. And so all of that's happening in this um, first phase. From there, once everyone sort of gets everything out onto paper or onto a screen where they're really able to see, yes, that's me and that's you know, the, the adapted version of me. Then we take them through um, a variety of different processes to help them get rid of those past programs. And this is where I think so much of what we, we as a community, what you all have so much expertise in various modalities from, from hypnosis and NLP to heaven knows what else. But we help people get to a point where they can start to forgive the past, um, forgiving themselves, forgiving others, and learning about mindfulness so that they could be really tuned into the present. Um, and then in step three, really becoming accountable. So no longer placing blame on anyone, never excusing that sometimes bad things happen, but recognizing that in this present moment, it's up to me to create my, my future. And so this accountability phase is um, step three. So again, when I'm doing this in a medical setting, I know that trauma lives in the body, in the brain, in our tissues, in our cells. And so we're doing basic things to give the body a sense of detox from diet and sleep and breath work and exercise. <clears throat> but then we're taking people into uh, you know, these other modalities to really get to the heart and soul. Um, so that they're, they're making this mind-body connection. And as I've gotten more and more woo-woo, <laughs> dealing with auras and you know, there's different practitioners in my community that have all sorts of gifts beyond the scope of my pea brain, but there are people who are, say they can do all sorts of clearings in all sorts of energetic levels. And, um, and then the accountability is a really big part of our program because for many of us who've experienced anything in childhood, if we didn't have that responsible caregiver or adult who could always be there for us, then we need to learn how to always be there for ourselves. And so as we make promises to ourselves, as we um, create new habits or try to make new habits, we need this accountability phase so that people don't fall back into that victim role and they stay in this, what we're trying to get them into is this hero role. And step four is about inspired action. And this is where we go back and look at the, in step one, the values, <clears throat> like finding out what people really value in life, like what is their true desire to experience in life. And in the meditation that I'll take you through, um, if they don't know what their inspired action is, they're encouraged to ask, you know, ask the higher self, go through meditation or whatever modality. And then we literally ask them not to take any action unless it's inspired action, which you know, sometimes works and sometimes you know, creates havoc but it's about helping people to reprogram themselves to not fall back on that autopilot, but instead to really get tuned in um, to source, to intuition, to the self, and, and attuned to love and all of that stuff. And then finally, step five is about appreciation. And this is once again, drawing off of the work in positive psychology, um, much of the beautiful work of Barbara Fredrickson with her broaden and build theory, which talks about really tuning into positive emotion. In particular for us, we, we really focus on gratitude. And we know now um, that it changes the brain, like the brain structure, looking at MRIs of people who practice, for example, the metta or the loving kindness meditation. Um, we see changes in the brain that are lasting. And so that's been incorporated into the meditation that I teach. That's it. So that is the five-step process. And in the book, there's obviously a, a ton more, 
but then we lead people through guided meditations. There's a manifesto, which has um, affirmations, if you want to call it that, and other support just by connecting with other people who, who are also on this path. Because again, many of us often feel that we're alone on this journey. So we've created a not-for-profit real self-love movement that allows people to connect online uh, and in live events as well. You know, that's fantastic um, that you've worked this out in such detail and in ways that people can grab hold of <laughs> intellectually as well as emotionally and spiritually. Um, I'm sure that uh, some of our uh, participants in this webinar have some questions and so we just open this up to people to uh, feel free to ask anything they're curious about. Is it too woo-woo or too sciencey? <laughs> Not for this crowd. This, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this, this crowd can, this is a full spectrum crowd that can go all the way from cognitive to, uh, and I don't, you know, I laugh and call it woo-woo, but um, a lot of the people on this webinar are very familiar with non-ordinary states of consciousness. So this is very much in their uh, in lingo. This is Doug. I always have questions. <laughs> So I'm very interested in, in your near-death-like experience and its role in uh, turning, turning your life around and especially your, your self-regard, if I could put it that way. And I find that I also have spent a lot of time reading near-death experiences and, and looking at them for it's a sort of little sound bites of what the spirit world or, or the other side is like uh, and, and in the, the individual's framework. So it's very fascinating to me. And of course, as we know, those experiences are almost always extremely transformative. Mm -hmm. uh, it can take a while to um, integrate them. Um, some of the researchers used to say it would take up to seven years to really integrate a full mm. near-death experience um, in, into one's um, personality, but I'm back to the idea of of, of its role in um, in healing your, your um, depressive side. I've, I've had those experiences as well, or ameliorating them and pulling you out and and, and getting you you going in a, in a positive way. And I've often thought. Um, so many of us, um, we, we go around, I'm talking about in the world at large, not, not this group in, in per se, but um, I'm talking about friends, family, and colleagues, and uh, so forth. Um, and we don't feel that connection you're talking about with the oneness. Mm -hmm. It's not an experienced reality. And, um, and I think that walking around and going around with that feeling of unity or connection with the oneness is changes everything about the way reality looks mm -hmm. and is perceived and how we relate to it and whether we're pessimistic or optimistic uh, about things and so part of my thinking has been along the lines of exactly what you're trying to do i think and that is to bring, and, and I think that's part of your um, self-love concept, uh, right? Is it would be, it would it would involve, wouldn't it, this sense of connection to the to source, to God, to oneness? Yeah. Yes. And how to? Uh, so I'm interested in your findings uh, and and how they unfold with regard to bringing people into that awareness and going. So that's, that's one little bit uh, would be a question. The question is, how are you finding that? How are you making that effective? How are you finding to, it, to make that work out? I mean, that's part of what the mind mirror, I think, is all about from what I've read. Uh, and, um, and I don't have a lot of experience yet. But uh, also other spiritual practices and so forth. But going back to your mother's patients who... Um, didn't respond to the uh, ear, ear acupuncture and didn't and or or got so far along uh, with their addiction or whatever it was and then kept relapsing and falling back and and you pointed out that they uh, 
they 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 had they didn't they didn't feel loved they didn't have self love and and uh so i'm sure your process is partly to instill that feeling as well however however that comes or from wherever it comes and my question is i've i've been around so many people who actually are seekers and um and quite sincere about it and sometimes even have some degree of mystical experience, but it doesn't integrate. Um, it doesn't become uh, owned, if I could put it that way. Mm. And um, and some of them are brilliant people, and nothing uh, nothing <laughs> seems to make it go forward, and they lapse back into kind of uh, isolation and solipsism. And um, I have uh, some friends like that, and it's like they'll respond to you, you know, in your presence. They'll, they'll wake up and and be energized and and say, "Oh, this is great," you know, and then by themselves um, fall back. And I am so at a loss to know um, how how to help them. Thank you for that. Uh, well, there's two two or three things that come to mind. First is yes i want to help people have that direct experience with source or with the essential self or with the essential self and then source <laughs> ultimately i want people to reconnect with that oneness because the experience that i had was it was instantaneous i just knew of course you're lovable you're a soul you're not a human it's just part of the game that when you incarnate, you have this ego, it's a construct. Like all of these ideas just made so much sense instantaneously that I didn't have to question anymore or feel like I had to perform for attention or affection. And so for me, I realized it was that direct connection with truth, with oneness. So I thought, well, how do I help other people have that? And so I write about in the book and I help people experience at workshops exactly that experiential so to your point doug i i also found that just being in someone's presence and having that reflection of love and acceptance is great for people it does energize them but breaking those habitual brain patterns and getting into the trauma loops it it takes it continued experiences and so you can't, if someone is always relying on someone else to mirror to them how lovable you are and perfect you are, then it doesn't tend to stick. And so over the years, what I have now done, um, I'm not a therapist, but all of my programs are therapeutic programs, but they're designed to make people do things. So it's experiential. I believe we need to embody this wisdom. It can't just be something that we psychologically get or, or talk therapy would work for everyone. You know, we'd, we'd recognize, oh, that's why my grandfather did that. Oh, he was traumatized too. Oh, I get it. Everyone would be healed. But there's something that happens that when we experience or we start to embody these changes and live in a different way, even if that's a, for us, like we do speaker programs, we do books, we do other training to help people share their message with the world. When they go through these programs, they're having to be someone else or be their authentic self, not someone else. It's not fake. And I find that, that that repeated action, it's almost like we're training the ego, which previously thought, oh, if I do, if I speak too loud or I talk about woo-woo things, I get rejected. We have to train that, that primitive part of us to see that, oh, it's okay for me to speak my truth. It's okay. And so creating a new family or you know, a tribe, as we call it, this community of people around the world, people now get to experience what it's like to share in your truth to do new things and not be rejected so because many of us were rejected by our family of origin and so i feel like the embodiment and the experiential are the two things that people were missing um, if we just look at traditional therapies and the reason i love this idea of, of doing studies with mind mirror is because now over the last decade i've met so many people who were doing I met um, a descendant of um, Aborigines in Australia who does this dream time healing and um, people who do um, deep memory processing, the work of Roger Wolger. Um, 
all of these different modalities of helping people go back to the source of their trauma in this lifetime or in others to clear that wound and then get them into the present moment. And so I believe that there are many different ways that you can heal from trauma. And for me, I love meditation. It's worked for all my life. And it's, it's re reproducible. It's not expensive. It doesn't have as much of the stigma as things like you know, LSD that, that, and all these other psychedelics that are now becoming popular. So I feel like if we can try these different modalities while people are hooked up to the mind mirror to demonstrate you know, in living color that they, they are the ones that are capable of changing their brainwaves themselves. And eventually, if you do it long enough or follow these protocols, you will get to that source consciousness. So that's, that's kind of my bias now. I feel like there's gotta be a way to ha help people have the experience that I had, maybe not in all the fantasticalness, but I think it's, I think it's possible. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I am. Did I answer both of your questions, Doug? Yeah, you just make make me have more questions. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I, this is this is amazing and wonderful that you're, you're talking about this because just a couple of weeks ago, I read a near death like experience on on the IANS website, and uh, they they publish a few every, every month. And it was a teenage uh, uh, girl, young woman, who was suffering t t severely from conditions like lupus. Um, autoimmune disorders and she was severely incapacitated and she gave up she was like like you she went to bed and she said god take my life and uh, it wasn't just help me it was take my life and uh, she went to went to sleep and she had what she called a dream and in that dream that dream was exactly like a near-death experience mm. it, totally and it had the same uh, sense of reality and uh, even overwhelming reality, even though she called it a dream and it appeared to have happened in her sleep. And I thought that is so fantastic, like your experience, because it didn't happen when she was physiologically near death. And so I thought, wow, maybe we can do something uh, with the state of our brain waves. You know, was she in deep delta and high gamma at the same time or something like that? I don't know. But, but, it, it, could we tend in that direction to make the hookup, uh, mm. which sounds so much like what, what you're thinking? I'd love to look at all the different modalities and ways that we can get people into these expanded states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think we're in a point now in the world where people are open to it because there have been so many you know, amazing doctors and other people who've shared their NDEs and now that people are biohacking and looking at nootropics and other ways to expand consciousness. I think the world's ready for it. So mm -hmm. any of you in this community who'd like to partner up, we are, this is gonna be a part of our focus in 2020 is to start looking at different modalities um, where people have protocols where we can follow um, not only brain waves, but other biomarkers. Part of my background at the end of my career was in longevity medicine. So looking at markers of, um, chronic disease and longevity markers like um, our telomeres and telomerase. Like we'd like to be able to get a bunch of biomarkers, put people into whatever their treatment program or control group, and obviously getting a bio a brain brainwave profile, taking them through these different modalities and checking at various points to see what changes in their physiology, in their mood, their sleep, their behaviors, and, and so on. Um, that just makes the nerd in me go crazy. <laughs> yes, and along that same line, uh, in January, uh, a substance abuse center uh, in New Jersey is buying a mind mirror and uh, three extra harnesses for a program that we're going to implement and uh, to help people with addiction problems. It's a substance abuse detox center and also a hospital. And um, so this sounds like a wonderful partnering attempt. Um, you know, they're wide open. They don't really know what sorts of things to do other than what they're already doing. Um, and of course, my plan is to um, have a research program for the Mind Mirror as well as for them uh, and take them through our series of meditations. 
but uh, and mix in some heart math sorts of coherence uh, measurements, but uh, certainly measure telomeres and and other things like that. So um, we should talk about you yes. know uh, inventing this program because if you're running it in France and we're running it in the U.S., then we have all kinds of uh, I don't know multi-level or layered uh, research opportunities here. Yeah, that would be ideal. One of our other physicians in Hollywood is also on board, and uh, she does anti-aging medicine or age management medicine as well, and doing the heart math certification. So she's been um, really excited to hear about me doing all this mind mirror training. Um, so yeah, I would love to be a part of that. Yes, the time has come. Yeah. And so let me just turn it back to you guys. Um, what questions do you have, especially about this five-step process? I mean, uh, there were there's aspects in your in your five steps and the and the subsections for each one that uh, each one seems incredibly rich in itself. Yeah. You know, you're really trying to help people disidentify from the ego and um, into higher and broader perspectives. Uh, that in the same way mindfulness does, mindfulness meditation does the exact same thing, helps people connect with the essential being. They think they're watching their thoughts, <laughs> but then at some point they have to ask, well, wait, who's the watcher? <laughs> you know? yes. And uh, But but really, uh, you've clearly thought this out and tested it. Uh, I think one of Doug's questions right there, how are people responding to it? Is it is the program working for people? And how are you uh, using the program in with groups or workshops or you you mentioned the uh, University of Monaco? Are they do you have students there trying it out? How's this whole thing working? Yeah, so I did it for two years at the University of Monaco, and then uh, when the book called. I stopped teaching and went hardcore to finish the book and moved to Italy for a short period of time to, to write. Um, so I have done it mainly with groups. Um, I, as I said, I'm not a therapist and I don't enjoy one-on-one -on -one therapy, although I do some mentoring. But generally, if I'm teaching in a group where I can kind of hone in on people and, and different aspects, that's how I like to do it, or um, in projects. So I mentioned in there, there's this life writing process. We host a, a three-day workshop here in the French Riviera where people can come and learn the, the hero's journey in this life writing process and either get it published in one of our books or they just do it for their own healing. And that for me is, is one of the great ways to facilitate uh, the process. So it's mainly been done in groups and in workshops. Uh, I'm leading the fourth, uh, the fourth time that I'll be leading this at a place in California called 1440 Multiversity in Scotts Valley in the, in the Redwoods. And we lead it there in a, a small-ish group where over five days, I take them through the five stages. They're also doing some Kundalini yoga and journaling. And the shifts that happen instantaneously are really profound. Like people are literally finding like, it seems like silly to say it, but they're recognizing patterns and drama and trauma that have bugged them for their entire lives and in a matter of getting it. I think we're probably also creating a field and I think that that has an impact. Um, but what we'll, we'll be able to see now over the next year We've got about 400 people, 450 people signed into the Real Self Love Movement where they get all of these videos and trainings totally for free. So we can start to follow people over time to see what happens if we're doing it at a distance, you know, just through cyberspace. But for me in general, I do it live in person in workshops. Well, that's fantastic. Hi, uh, Andrea. Uh, this is Steven. Um, I, I was interested in hearing about your program. It turns out that that that's a book that my local library has, as a matter of fact. And um, I guess the main thing I'm interested in about that is is it is the program more a reflection of the various processes that you have gone through yourself, as you sort of just outlined at the beginning of your talk, 
or would it be more accurately described as techniques that you have tried uh, in working with clients that seem to work for them, you know, or is it just a combination of the two? It is a combination. Um, everything in the book I've tried. Um, some of it is just tried and true therapy, you know, like typical gestalt things or like the, the inner child work that we do, um, the two chair technique or drawing on uh, the compassionate caregiver um, process. Some of this is just tried and true stuff from psychology, but all of it have, are, includes things that I've personally done um, for myself, as well as with my patients. I see. And I'm kind of curious, um, because in the first part of your talk, you used the phrase, I was doing, um, I was doing medica meditation in some way. And uh, do you, when you work with people, do you track how they're meditating? Like when you start work with, working with them, would most of them say they're meditating in some way or not meditating in any way? And then as they progress through your healing process, would you say their the way they meditate changes? Yes. The, the program that I teach, there's an entire meditation piece of it. Um, the process that I'll lead you through today is called the attunement process. And the five stages of attunement mirror the five stages of the cornerstone process. And in that um, attunement, you'll notice as I'm saying it, you'll notice that there are pieces of um, like mindfulness and body scanning and inquiry where we're going introspection, speaking to the body, speaking to parts. Um, we do the meta meditation in stage three. So, um, so there's that five stage process, which was I, originally designed for people who um, were dealing with addiction. So it was meant to get them into neutral and then into a positive state so that they had more control over impulse um, behaviors. It later became just something that I use with everyone because we realized that even if you're not stressed, if you go through this five stages, you can get to that sense of unity consciousness. And that's what I want to hook people up with the mind mirror. But also in the program, we have different meditations. So we have a basic meditation on creating a safe space. So it's a guided audio meditation. It's also printed in the book so people could just read it and then do it on their own, where they literally imagine themselves getting into a safe space so that they can start to create anchors in the body. We have a breath meditation. We have a body scan meditation. So we have all these different types of meditation so that people can try out the ones that actually work for them, that, um, that they're reliably going to come back to. But um, there's not one that I, I force people to do. We give them the choice and we invite them to experience all of them until they figure out which ones really work for them. What, what I mean is after they've done the program and the healing and all that, do they, do they become regular meditators? Does that become part of their life if it hasn't been before? What we saw with follow-up, I haven't done the follow-up lately, but the last follow-up we did, we, did, we saw that 70% of them were incorporating the attunement process into their lives. Um, it, the five stages, it'll probably take me 10 minutes to lead you through it or longer, depending on how much time we have. Um, you could literally do... The, this five-step meditation in eight minutes or five minutes. People will do it as they're standing in line. They'll do it in meetings. And so that's been the most consistent feedback I've gotten from people is that once they learn the five steps and they know that it's portable, they can do it anywhere, nobody has to see or even know that they're meditating um, because you, you can do it with your eyes open if, you're, if you have to. Um, and so about 77% of our patients were reporting that they were continuously um, doing that five-step meditation. That's really excellent. That's a very high percentage. That can I think make- they're also highly motivated. <laughs> yes, exactly. I was gonna say that can make the difference between life and death for someone who's coming out of trauma or addiction. Uh, yeah. So do we have other questions? Uh, yes, I had a comment uh, and this has to do Mostly with uh, your mention of the addictions program that I think you said in New Jersey or whatever is going to be starting. Just, just a comment that you might want to keep in mind either for yourself or the people involved. I spend a good deal of, of a section in my hypnotherapy training program 
dealing with addictions and why the traditional approach has been so ineffective. And just one of those things which you might not, there's some of it from traditional psychology, but one that's not usually recognized or talked about is attached other entities that had addictive behavior. And when they get in a person's field, they can profoundly affect and create all kinds of things from a suicidal behavior to addictions, to uh, food cravings, different behaviors that were not present before. It's just something to keep in mind that for, for those people doing that research to be aware that there are, as you well know, there are many different dimensions and many of those beings hang out in the astral. And when we get depressed, exhausted, accident, something happens in the hospital, funeral, our, our field is open and they can attach and suddenly there's all kinds of problems begin to come up. So it's just something to keep in mind for that research project, okay? That's all. Yeah, that's a good caution. And it's also an excellent reason why we ourselves would want to be and then in turn teach other people to be in touch with that essential being because how do you deal with that light, that darkness, but through light, increasing your inner light. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. Sure. Anybody else have questions or comments? Paula, anything from you? You work with a really interesting population yourself. Well, first I want to thank you. It was a really interesting presentation. Um, I kind of had a similar experience to you, but completely different. And I, I wonder, do you ever, maybe I'm greedy, but do you ever find yourself wanting to go back to that experience that you had? Like you just want to leave all the things that are going on around you and trying to come in and you just want to find that place. And I think the, the point of it is you can't find it because it has to be passive. It has to come to you. And I kind of find myself trying to get that experience again and it, it eludes me. So that was one of my questions. That's and a that's great question. <laughs> Everyone wants to know the answer to that one. Thank you. What and was your my, other one? my second question is when I'm working with clients, I find kind of the same, a similar pattern that if I get a client in and this is a client that I really am invested in helping and, you know, I think I have all the answers right and we're going to do, you know, alpha theta, we're going to do, you know, heart rate variability those are the clients that are the hardest for me to impact. And it's the ones where you think, oh my gosh, I, I have no idea. Like this, this habit has gone on for so long and this client is in such a, a sorry state that I don't even know where to start. And because maybe I, I have given up, not given up, but I have admitted my inadequacies that those are the same clients that heal the fastest. <laughs> I love that. That sense of surrender, right? Well, for me, I do love being in states of expanded consciousness. And so meditation has become a part of my life and on a daily basis. And when I first moved here and I didn't have so many responsibilities, I would spend hours between the, the Qigong practice and meditation. <clears throat> So I do love being in that state and I go to it very regularly, several times a day. Um, but part of my spiritual practice has also taught me that um, I've got work to do. So I can't just hang out in meditation constantly. There are other things that I need to do for the evolution of my soul and my karma so that um, I'll just leave it at that. Gotcha. Andrea, I did enjoy very much hearing your abbreviated life story there. And I just wanted to zoom in on one particular part of that, which I can relate to due, due to a recent uh, experience that I had. And that may be one of the more critical parts of your story, which is um, where you said you were working as a professional jazz singer in Paris. And then uh, after that, had some kind of a spiritual illumination, which changed your life. Um, do I have the basics of that sort of correct? Because um, I've been torn myself between um, 
uh, science and engineering and performing and artistic things my whole life. And I just had this recent, uh, I don't know what you would call it, revelation that, hey, I don't have to put on a show for anybody. You know? mm. And is that at all like the experience you had where, where you said, I, I don't have to be up in front of people proving that I have this talent, you know, making them happy, being an entertainer, informing people and all that, that, that I have a higher purpose? Is that all like what you experienced? It did. It, I experienced that and it's been flipping around. So when I first moved here to France, <clears throat> because I'd had that experience and that vision, I thought, okay, it's, it's time. I had already been singing um, after that experience. I was writing music. But when I got to France, I happened to meet a, a DJ and started doing uh, musical performances along the Riviera and into Italy and Monaco. But it was interesting because not even a year into it, it wasn't that I was bored, but I felt like, okay, I'm done. And it seemed really odd to me that I would have had that such a strong vision. And so I just sort of put it off to the side. And that was also when I started um, teaching at the University of Monaco. So I was just like singing for myself, singing for fun. And um, it's been over the last two years in particular that once again, I'm having this resurgence within me and tons of signs in the outside world. And the, the message has been, it's time for you to sing. And it's not about, you know, becoming a superstar or releasing albums, but I've been told through a number of different meditative processes and mediums and uh, a friend who passed on this year, um, I've just been told it's time for you to sing. So I do feel like somehow the singing is part of a, a, a higher purpose that I don't know. Um, I don't have like a clear direction like I normally would with my business. Um, I did sing live uh, on the TEDx stage when I gave my third TEDx this, this year. And now I'm just open. I'm open to what the source leads me to next. Yeah, you know, I was, I was kind of comparing your story to uh, Walter Longo. You may be familiar with him. He's sort of a superstar in the longevity field. And he started out uh, in college trying to be a jazz guitarist, I think it was. Hmm. And, and then completely switched over biology. They told him it was crazy. But that has some rough similarities to, to your story, I guess, um, because he found that science was his true calling and, and made some important contributions to longevity. But, but he started out wanting to be a rock star. And I was just wondering if that was like ever in your mind, you know, you always want to be up there and be famous and everything. Yeah, for me at this point, it's not about the fame because now all I want to sing about is more spiritual stuff, which is, you know, not the kind of stuff you turn on the radio and hear. But I definitely, I, I feel that <clears throat> that's going to be a significant part of my life going forward. And I've been doing it. I, I perform live here in France to a, um, an audience that, of light workers and healers. And it, it's, it just keeps confirming for me that it's, it's a part of my life and it's going to be bigger. What that means, I don't know. We'll stay tuned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the time is coming when um, spiritual improvisational music, as I call it, and spiritual singing, as you call it, which is uh, the way I see it, a spiritual tuning fork, mm. uh, is going to be more and more of what people crave. Yeah. It's still, I mean, a large number of people do now, but you can... People can might not have clairvoyance or clairaudience, but everyone has clairsentience, feeling of higher awareness. And when people hear that kind of music, you know, it can make a huge difference. So I'm happy to hear that you are going to be a singer. And of course, that you're using your voice and your books, you're using your voice to guide people in meditation. So maybe that urge that's coming up for you now is just saying, turn the tuning forks up to greater amplification and singing. Maybe you have just a biorhythm. In any case, we do certainly welcome uh, your leading us in this meditation. And anytime you're ready, uh, we're ready. Awesome. Okay. So 
typically we would start off with five deep breaths, deep belly breaths. You can uh, diaphragmatic breathing for those of you that already know how to do that. Slowing down the breath such that you are breathing in to the count of six, if possible. Holding for two counts. And then exhale to the count of six again. And in again. And hold for two and exhaling slowly. And in again, we, we do these five slow deep breaths, holding at the top to initiate the relaxation response. And with each exhalation, we simply imagine that our body becomes more and more relaxed. It's as if we're breathing in peaceful energy, allowing it to circulate throughout our body and brain, and then exhaling any stagnant energy, letting the toxins out through the breath, out through the feet, and with these five deep breaths, we're just bringing ourselves, hopefully, to a neutral state. So the first step of the attunement meditation is allow. So as you're now breathing at your own pace and rhythm, allow yourself to get tuned into the body. Just feel whatever surface that you're sitting on Allow your body to stay erect, but relaxed in your tendons. Feeling the cushion, feeling the earth beneath, beneath your feet. And just allow your awareness to scan the body for any signs of tension or pain. And if you do find an area of tension or worry, just breathing into, imagine that you could breathe fresh chi, that life force energy into that part of the body. And as you exhale, you're letting go of the tension or the toxins. For some who've had significant pain or disease processes going on, in this step, as you're allowing your body to be felt, I'm inviting you to not judge those feelings or judge yourself for having those pains or that disease process. And as much as you're able to be non-judgmental, ask your body what message it has for you because both physical ailments and our emotions are energy in motion. They are messengers. So allow yourself to just be open and curious. What is the message that that pain or that disease process has for you? And allow it to be heard without judgment, without stifling it, without trying to will it away. Same goes for our thoughts. Of course, for beginning meditators, that monkey mind with so many thoughts, many clients will start to judge themselves or judge the process. But in step one, we allow ourselves to recognize the thoughts, allow them to be there, they have their own right, but not grab a hold or get attached to them and travel down their rabbit hole. So in this first step, we're becoming that non-judgmental witness.
Everything is allowed to be as it is, without judgment. And as we are now settled in with our body and breath, we move to step two, which is to attune. We know that our body is like an antenna. We know that radio waves, for example, TV waves are all around us. So in step two, I invite you to imagine what it would be like if you could tune in to the, the radio station of WLUV. What would it be like if you tuned into the love that is present around all of us? For some, it's easier if we imagine some compassionate being, a saint, an angel, a loved one who's passed on, the Christ, the Buddha, Muhammad. Just imagine if there was a compassionate being just beaming love at you and you could actually pick up on those waves. The feeling of having that unconditional acceptance and compassion, that loving kindness directed at you for no other reason than that you are here and present. Imagine that compassionate being or that love radio station is telling you your love. You are worthy. You are enough. You are love. And when our clients have more time, I invite them to take that feeling of love and imagine that they could send it out. Sending that love from your heart, that compassion that you have to someone close to you, to this entire group, or maybe to someone who's suffering across the world. Just imagine what it would feel like if you could send from your heart love, care, attention, and acceptance. Whether you see it as light or a little sparkly fairy dust, just imagine that you can send that loving, compassionate energy to someone in need. And now tuned into love and compassion. We move to step three. In step three, we align. Align your mind with the mind of the divine. In this phase, we ask that the ego take a back seat. And we might even say, let my mind be guided by peace. Or not my will, but the will of God or love. Let my mind be guided by that. For people who are stressed or in contentious life situations, this is a surrendering of ego and an opening up to realizing that there may be wisdom that they don't possess. And by just letting go of their need to be right or, or the one solution they have in mind, that by agreeing to align our mind with a higher mind, we open up 
to possibility. Some people will get flashes of insight here and others find that it happens later on in their day or in their dreams. And step four, from this positive open state, it's all about inspired action. So we ask, what is the inspired action I should take or could take next? And we agree that we will only act on inspiration. So we can ask for or act on inspiration. For some, it's just a simple question of asking, what is my next step? Or from the Course in Miracles, one may ask, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? Being open to that inspiration is something we can carry with us. And then step five, appreciation. We ask that you bring to your awareness one thing that you are truly grateful for, that you can truly appreciate. For some of our most stressed clients, it might just be the fact that they got five minutes to themselves. It could be something as simple as being grateful for the warm blanket that's around your shoulders, that you have enough food for you and your family. Just bring to mind one thing that that you appreciate and feel that sincere gratitude. And you can say thank you. If it involves another person or several people or God or even yourself, thank yourself for being brave enough, courageous enough, or diligent enough to do your meditation practice, to hold your tongue when you might have wanted to snap at someone, or for being able to speak up and speak your truth. Giving thanks from the heart, whether spoken or not, does wonders for maintaining this high vibe And now knowing that we are going to close out this meditation, we take all of this positive energy and openness to wisdom and insight. And just, if you're willing, imagine that you can dedicate this time that you've allowed for yourself and for your own development. And imagine that you could give the benefit to someone else someone who wasn't able to tune in for whatever reason. And just imagine that you're saying, may they be blessed with the same benefit that I've received. And know that we can carry this with us this love, connection, compassion, and openness to insight. 
And as we come back into our group process now, you can just take a deep breath, filled with that positivity and gratitude. And when you're ready, move your muscles, your toes, stretch, take some deep breaths and come back. Come back. Hmm. So I don't know, I didn't watch exactly how many minutes that was, but we can do it in five minutes, 15 minutes, or you know, people can stay in different phases. Sometimes when people are truly dealing with addiction or impulse control, they'll just do step one for a whole week before even trying to tune into like love and compassion and openness. So that's it. That's the attunement process. And that's what I would love to um, hook up a lot of brains to the mind mirror and see what happens as they go through that. The mind mirror would love for you to do that and we'll support you in any and every way in doing so. I wonder if we uh, have any feedback from people online with us who participated in the attunement process. Anybody want to comment? The, the salient feature that I got from your meditation is that, and tell me if I'm wrong, but the main focus of your healing program is attuning people with the present, with with what's happening now in their lives, it's kind of like a mindfulness. Uh, it's kind of drawing its inspiration from mindfulness because uh, during your ta earlier talks and during your meditation, I was always drawn right up into recent events or things that can happen in the near future. Do I have the correct interpretation of your healing methods? Yes, yes. Because it was originally created for people with impulse control, it was about bringing them into the present moment and helping them tune into positivity. Um, later, as people got more advanced with it, then they could, when they open up to inspiration, for example, then they could start doing future stuff. Um, like thinking about, okay, this project or manifesting love or getting a new job. Um, people have used it for manifesting things as well. Is and there, also healing. Yeah, is, there, is there any... Is there any element in your program that allows people to go way back in their past childhood, early childhood? I mean, is that allowable at all? Absolutely. Over the last few years, that's been the, the thing I've added. Um, usually that's done either in a group process or one-on-one. -on -one, uh, and it's, it's also outlined in the book. Typically, I haven't recorded... Um, many of the audio meditations for doing that because the client population that I worked with was so um, traumatized that it, they needed to have a facilitator. Um, but in the book, we invite people to do exactly that, to go uh, even into their childhood. So when we do like inner child work, they could go back and identify a moment in time that they would like to do some processing around. But this one that I've shared for you is just about getting into the, the positive present moment. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to dominate the conversation here, but just one last thing. Does your, does your program also encourage people to do spiritual exploration or is it more like you're saying here, bam, this is wisdom I've discovered I have to communicate to you or is it more like encouraging people to find it themselves by deep introspection and searching and so forth? It is the latter. It's me asking them to go as deep as they, as they are willing to go I through in, introspection and a variety. You know, I don't uh, promote any one particular spiritual practice, although a lot of what I do is based in Buddhism. But yes, I'm inviting people to identify what their spiritual path is and to stick with it, even if it is just a matter of connecting with source. Is that kind of the way you see meditation, that meditation is? connecting with your spiritual path it is understanding your orientation towards religion and spiritual things for me it is i see it as a path for for us all to sort of purify that the connection purify karma and return us to a state of our our wholeness okay and sounds good 
But I mean, if, if you're drawing from Buddhists, you talk a lot about God too. So you're kind of balancing the two there. Because in yeah. Buddhism, you don't need to talk about God. But if you talk about God, you don't need to talk about Buddhists. So <laughs> got all the, all the, both sides covered there. <laughs> yes. One, one more quick question, Andrea. Um, have you found at all, well, I'll just speak from some past uh, situations where I've been in um, seminars or, or meditation retreats where uh, this attempt to connect up with love and experience it, embody it and so forth uh, actually brings some people uh, into the, their first awareness of they're not having been that love. And so then initially there's kind of that, um, that sorrow, that devastation of, of that, that experience uh, from, from the original wound, if you would. Uh, have you found that to be the case sometimes? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And that's what's happening in that second phase where they're getting to that point of acceptance after going through the awareness phase and identifying where maybe that original wound started, there is a lot of grief work that mm -hmm. comes up for people um, it, during the, the cornerstone process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrea, I want to say a word. I really appreciate how brilliantly you put things together in this meditation. And even when I was watching your interview, pointed out that it has a lot in common with Anna Weiss's protocol for awakened mind training that we do. I mean, mm -hmm. it's common when any meditation starts with relaxation and slowing your breath and scanning your body. It's quite common. But then the elements like, you know, allowing, I think it's very critical there because it touches straight that point where you were saying not worthy, so you're not allowing yourself. And it's the core of trauma that you mentioned how you understand trauma, I mean, the core that you found. And then you go uh, to compassion. And that's where I thought it was a turning point. And many meditations lack because so many people get stuck because they still caught, are caught up in their baiting, their thinking, and they're trying to relax, but they kind of, they, they're not either not allowing, not opening their alpha or they, they cannot get to their theta. And that's what to me is this compassion, compassion, which is the turning point, which starts melting you. And that's how I felt at least. And which helps you to finally uh, kind of establish this deeper connection <laughs> mm -hmm. with yourself, with truth, with oneness, uh, and kind of uh, lots of things we talked about today. I think people are caught up in their minds, in our intellect, and we don't go to our heart, to our soul. It just, it's like there is no warmth there, you know, lots of theories, lots of right ideas, but there is no warmth, no movement, no connection. And that's when you get to this compassion, and then through that, you say, we are love. And I felt that connection, you know, mm -hmm with that love myself so establishing that connection and that's like oil it's oiling that flow that you need to get that you need to be in and after oiling that flow kind of seasoning melting you open up the channel to get messages from whatever higher self god higher wisdom and to me that particular part of the meditation is spiritual I don't know how other people understand spirituality, but as soon as you establish connection and admit there is some higher force existing there and you're ready to open up and receive this love and wisdom and whatever you are willing and able to receive, that's where spirituality comes in place in whatever form. Finishing up with uh, inspire, inspired action, it's not just like, yes, we, we oiled everything, we received these messages, insights, so don't leave it there. Don't leave it as theory. Kind of see yourself taking action. See yourself taking action with ease from that process of flow. Mm -hmm. And then appreciation, of course, it's like sealing it all and say, yes, that's what I want and inviting more into your life rather than like appreciating your immediate experience and all insights and possible future experience that will lead to bigger you, better you, healed you, true you, in your words. So I'm using a little bit of my own, you know, wording 
but I, I hope I, I got the core of, you know, uh, of your meditation. And thank you. Actually, I, you reminded me of something I was doing back in like 2012. <laughs> I just, after all meditation, this is my very short meditation practice in the morning where I wanted to get out of my mind, get out of my busy monkey brain, which is very judgmental and like pushing and pressing. And, and it's all about uh, not good enough. You have to do more. You have to do this and tons of ideas and tons of things to do and take that pressure away and allow ease and allow this smoothness and uh, allow insights and allow inspired action. That's exactly what, what I was seeking. Mm. So um, I have a couple of more comments that might be useful, just kind of summarizing what you were talking about today and how your own experience is actually connected and very well reflected in the topic of today because it's we are talking about healing what are we healing we're healing like chronic illness through connecting with true self depression trauma and like to me how i understood it or like not understood it for the first time but kind of crystallize it for myself chronic illness it's this kind of dis-ease so there is no ease there is no flow that you're carrying through life because you're not true to yourself you're wearing a, a very heavy mask living someone else's life being unable to live who you are there is no ease there that's why it's disease and it becomes chronic and then uh depression as you said uh and as i realized myself because i was at that very like I consider like what was depression for me what's the essence of it and I found no it's not about suicide and it's not about it's about the end but end of what you realize you are in the edge you're on the turning point it's the end of your life that you lived you want different lives and the change wouldn't be the correct word it would be transformation it's mm. the turning point and transformation point it's you collect skin. You need to shake your old skin, become new self, turn from caterpillar to butterfly. You have to transform the life that you lived. It's that turning point. That's what depression was for me. And again, it's transforming back to who you truly are, not who you're playing, the roles and fake ego. And then trauma, again, it's the core of it, as you said. You discovered that like deeply traumatized people, that they, they were carrying this sense of not good enough a uh, sense of unworthiness and as a result you, you constantly like you're not allowing yourself you're basically not allowing yourself to be worthy to receive uh to live to to be who you are and um uh, again it all leads back to be who you are be your true self and uh, the last thing i wanted to say it was interesting listening to you you were discussed to I mean, describing your personal experience in France when you got into that beautiful flow, you, know, you got into that ease, so you felt the state. And then when you were talking about when you gave up and uh, you felt the presence uh, and you felt kind of this blessing and loving presence, I felt that there was something in common, at least it felt like to me, you, you have to, to, to say or confirm that, whether that ease and flow had the same or similarity to that state, or it was open enough to that state of connection with presence and receiving the wisdom that you received and then receiving the vision of your future life. So really what, what you were describing, to me it logically, you know, found this itself or repeated itself, mirrored itself in this attunement meditation because it was getting into that, you know, allowing, going away from judgment, allowing yourself and uh, getting into that flow, getting into that love, receiving the wisdom and then get inspired with that, inspired with what you see and how you can live your life. And again, it's very well fits with the awakened mind uh, training, the meditation that we do, the protocol that we do. So thanks a lot for for this <laughs> i hope my explanation wasn't messy <laughs> oh it was perfect it was a excellent summary um you hit on all of the points and it's funny because this started evolving back in 2007 and which was long before i discovered um, max cade's work you know i only 
stumbled upon his work two years ago. So it's funny that, of course, many other people have told me the same thing, that they've also created meditations that follow this pathway. But um, I'm actually quite inspired that it, it so nicely aligns with um, Anna's protocol and that hopefully we will be able to get people into these awakened and evolved minds and maybe even more. I have no doubt with your lovely voice that will certainly facilitate that. Your tuning fork voice and your very high concepts and your love for people. I think we probably always all felt that during the meditation and um, surely do appreciate your coming here and sharing uh, your book. Uh, I expect that we'll all rush right out and uh, buy a copy of it. And I really enjoy the uh, PowerPoint show. And I look forward to working with you some more and to your future with this Mind Mirror community. Um, I tell you, it just gets better all the time. We're going to have a <laughs> webinar next month and we'll talk about all the ways in which this work is getting better and better and hope to see you then. Uh, unless anybody else has any last minute comments. Judith, I will only ask Andrea to point maybe if people are interested, if our guests are interested, or whoever will be watching this webinar later, what's the next step? If they are interested in your work, uh, would mm. it be the right step to get the book or go to some website or join some group online or join some live training or research that you're going to undertake? Because there could be few paths. You know, someone may decide, oh, I need healing myself and this is one path, or some other practitioners here may decide, oh, we would like to join the research and do something together. So could you please guide us? What would be wise? Where should we go? Great question, Oksana. Thank you for that. Yes. Well, you can join the Real Self Love Movement, either yourself or for clients, and get access to all of the guided meditations that are mentioned in the book. So you don't have to buy the book just to get all the bonus material. By visiting realself.love, you'll get access to all of those, those things totally for free. Um, if you are interested in partnering with us, you have a, a healing modality that you might like to share with me, you can check out innatevitality.com. That's I-N and then the number eight, innate vitality.com and that's for all of this sort of holistic healing conventional medicine along with ancient wisdom and that's where our research base will be working from going forward and what else oh if you want you can also download the first lesson of my attunement meditation course where you can get uh, the audio of the practice that i led today by visiting attunementmeditation.com so those are the three ways you can connect. Attunementmeditation.com. And uh, you can then download the first lesson of the course with the course material. So thank you all. Thank you, Judith and Oksana, for allowing me to share my story. I'm so excited. I, I, I came home from your place, Judith, just buzzing and so excited about where my future is going with studying brain waves and, and helping people connect to source. You have no idea. Um, so I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. We are buzzing right alongside you. Thank you so much <laughs> for being with us today and on into the future.